Welcome back to our series on statistical methods. I'm Mark Ledbetter. This is lecture nine. We are in part four of chapter three in the textbook that we're using, which is design and analysis of experiments by Montgomery and edition eight or the eighth edition. This is lecture nine, uh, as I mentioned, and we are talking about one factor experiments or one way ANOVA. So previously, we've talked about um, the fact that we use one-way ANOVA when there are more than two levels of interest with one uh, factor. So this is much more efficient and powerful than a two-sample, uh, multiple two-sample t-test. Um, and it has better uh, type 1 error. Then um, we have our model here. We have the assumptions. And that's what we're doing now is we're, we're checking the assumptions. That's what we've been doing. Uh, we also talked about ANOVA. The, the basis for it is that it's the decomposition of the total sums of squares, uh, differences or errors if you want, um, into uh, multiple parts. In this case, for the one-way ANOVA, it's broken out into treatments and then the remainder, which is the error, or called the error. Okay. And um, this is a... Uh, comic from PhD Comics, and uh, I find them funny. Apparently, the author found it funny because this is from his uh, PowerPoint slides. So um, I don't want to uh, take up your time uh, talking about uh, something uh, funny here, but I will let you read this on your own, and uh, hopefully you'll get uh, uh, a chuckle out of it like I did. Okay. So we are uh, getting ready to check the adequacy of our model for the ANOVA. And so these assumptions that we need to check include normality and constant variance. And we've talked about how to do those, but there's another way to, to, uh, to do this with the ANOVA function. So we will go over that so that uh, instead of running separate tests, you can do this all uh, in one command in R. And so instead of having to run a normality test separately or a, a QQ plot separately or uh, and uh, doing the uh, Levine's test for equality of variances, we can just plot out some charts or graphs and look at those. And that's what we'll do in this video or the next. Then also the independence. We need to check and make sure that these are independent um, random variables, that the observations are not dependent upon each other. If that's the case, then we have to scrap what we're doing and do something completely different. We also want to know if we have a good fit for the model. Is this the right model? And we're going to use regression for that. And then what if the, some of the assumptions are violated, like the variance? What do we do to correct for uh, non-constant variance? All right. Or, and or the uh, right fit of the model as well. So we'll show that in the next video. So let's talk about residuals. We're going to use residuals to um, help us analyze the model fit, or not the model fit, I'm sorry, the, uh, the normality and the um, constant variance, uh, independence, uh, yes, and we can even use it for the uh, right fit, but, but we don't in this case, but we could if we wanted to. All right. So the residual we've gone over is given as little e i sub, uh, sub i and j is equal to y sub i j minus y hat sub i j. And it, we can replace uh, y hat sub i j um, with y i dot bar. And this is using the regression line in this text uh, so that's the model y is equal to alpha plus beta times x minus x bar uh, plus epsilon ij. So this would be uh, i and this would be um, ij. Okay. So the computer definitely generates these residual plots. They are useful. It also uh, generates a normality plot of the residuals. And so instead of having separate normality plots or QQ plots for each of the different treatment levels or factor, we can look at it all at once. And so this is a different software than R that generated this uh, plot, but um, it's going to look very similar to what we have. And I will show you that here in just a minute. So on our y-axis, we have the normal percent probability. So this is the cumulative um, probability. 
This is the CDF of a standard normal distribution, okay? And then we have um, the residuals on the x-axis, and these are not standardized or anything. So what's supposed to happen here is these points are supposed to fall along this line very closely. And, uh, and we're more concerned in the middle. Uh, by the way, this point here is not a point. This is um, x bar, y bar. That point is always on um, the regression line. Okay, so, um, and x bar here is the um, residual, which is uh, the mean of it is uh, zero. And then this will be uh, whatever, I can't draw a straight line, but it's going to be somewhere close to uh, 50%. In fact, I think it is 50%. That makes sense. Okay, and um, so for this, it's going to be 0.5, the mean of the, or the middle point of it's going to be 50, and that is a 50, yes. And then wherever 0 is, not 0.1, it's going to be 0. <clears throat> and so that is on this line at all times. When we're using residuals, the mean is 0. Um, exactly. The average resi residual uh, is going to be 0 across the ex experiment. Uh, we did this with an example, but um, in... Uh, another class, and we came up with a little bit off, but that was because of rounding errors, okay? So the only time you won't come up with uh, zero is if you round the values of the residuals, which you don't want to do. The computer does it um, precisely, and so we always get zero, and um, or some number that's ridiculously close to zero, like 10 or 8 times 10 to the negative 14 or something along those lines. All right. Now, <clears throat> This point here, this point here, they're in the middle, and they would concern me more than this point or this point, okay? Uh, we, are, we expect that near the tails of the distri distribution, extreme values, that these points may not line up with the, um, uh, the forced quantile that we create for these points. Because, uh, again, it's a random sample, so an extreme value uh, is just out there, and the probability that they're close to the value that you expect them to be is going to be pretty small. Because just their occurrence is a small probability of occurring. Okay? So when you have this random occurrence and fluctuation, and you get an extreme value, it seems logical that those values may not fit the model as well as the points that aren't that don't have such a small probability of occurring, okay? So, um, so these at the each end, or the extremes of the line, we're not as concerned about, but they are, in, in this uh, picture, they don't look that far away. And so, um, it's a good picture in that respect, and we're going to look at a different, how our uh, program R does this, and uh, at least the um, method that we're using in this class, which is one of the simpler methods. Okay. There are some more complicated and, and programming intense methods may, that may give you um, this type of output and the scale is uh, well done and easy to read. All right, enough on that. So what I do see is I see a pattern here in the middle and I see kind of a... a a sinusoidal type of pattern uh, along this line, and that concerns me. Um, it's, it, it's not just random above and below. There seems to be a pattern to the line, so we might not have a linear fit here. We might have some curvature to our fit, but we'll look at that. So let's see the code that we use in R. Now, I've given the whole screenshot of uh, R Studio here instead of just the code like I normally do. And I had three different programs open, and uh, the program that I was using here was this. You'll get a different file because I'm. Uh, uh, it'll be basically uh, this file here that's geared towards just doing the work and the response so that you can basically uh, substitute in your problems and do these uh, fairly easily. So I'm trying to make the code easy for you, whether, whereas with my lecture, 
I may be explaining things that you don't want to include in your report if you were reporting to your boss because you're not lecturing, you're, you're presenting uh, a solution to a problem. Okay, so we've created earlier, we've created this ANOVA uh, 1 object uh, using etch rate and power. Power is a factor that has four levels. Uh, let's see, it was uh, 550, 580, uh, 6, let's, oh, I'm sorry, 160, 180, 200, and 220. It's over here, the power. Not the, the, these are fitted values. I have to be careful which chart you look at. Okay, so just saying plot ANOVA gives you all four of these charts. Now, if you don't use this statement above, I'll zoom in, um, this says rows, and this says columns. And it tells me how many uh, graphs that I can put on each row and how many graphs I can put on each column of one figure. Okay, And the default is here, one and one. So I'm going to change this. Since I have four graphs, I'm going to change it to two and two. Then I'm going to plot, and then I'm going to change it back to the, to the default. It's always wise to change it back to the default, one plot per um, one figure, okay? So it's a very simple command, just plot ANOVA, and it gives us these four graphs, which we're going to analyze. So let's get started from that, with that. So the first thing I'm going to look at is uh, norm normality. Now, I what I've done is instead of having all four of these in one figure, I did not run... Uh, this first command just plotted this, and it gave me four thumbnails up here. The third of which was the QQ plot, so I clicked on it. I only had one. I copied as a, I right-clicked and copied as an image, and then I pasted to my PowerPoint uh, as a picture. And um, so when I look at this, um, I'm saying from experience that there are no uh, obvious departures from normality. But if you look at this, this is the default, how the computer prints it out. You may say, well, points three and seven, uh, aren't they outliers? Aren't they far away? Aren't they making this non-normal? And so this is a dis misleading graph, and this is the default. And that's what happens sometimes with the easier options, uh, such as this blanket plot of the ANOVA, it, it doesn't give us the greatest um, graph to analyze. Notice that the Y scale, and remember these are standardized residuals, so these are Z scores. They go from negative 1.5 to positive 1.5. And then we have um, the quantiles, the theoretical quantiles of Y, and that goes from negative 2 up to positive 2. So it's not the same scale. You'll also notice that the um, width is bigger than the height, that this is a rectangle, and that's the default as well. And so we don't really have this great comparison uh, to be able to see, you know, how does this look. So this is actually skewing the results, okay? So I've said that these points are not cause for, for concern, and this is based on experience. It's much more difficult for you, being new to this, to know when and when not to say this is an issue and not an issue. So um, I'm going to help you uh, be able to do this a lot more confidently rather than relying on, um, you know, experience, which you, you may not have yet. Okay. So it takes a lot of experience doing this over and over again to, to figure out what is and isn't an issue, okay? So we are um, more concerned about deviations near the center of the line, as I mentioned before. And so this point, and, and well, not so much the last one, but this point is a little ways away from the line. Is it too far? And so is this one. Uh, because they're in the middle of the line, they make me more concerned than these uh, point three and point seven. So what I've done is I've given you the code here, and again, I have the whole, um, so this is the whole screenshot of our studio. Um, so you can see what it looks like in, in entirety. But here is the important part. So what I've done is I've created this object standard residual one, uh, the ANOVA object that I created, ANOVA one is what I called it. I type it in, and I put this 
dollar sign, and it gives me a list of things. And among those lists is residuals. So I chose residuals. And what I want is a z-score. So remember that z is equal to x minus mu divided by sigma, or x minus x bar minus s, the standard deviation, if you want to um, estimate this with the, pot, uh, with the sample, which is what we have. So um, we're doing this, but remember that x bar is identical to zero for the residual. So I don't need to subtract anything. I just need to divide by its standard deviation. So what I've done is I've taken the ANOVA-1 residuals here. If you minus zero, you get the same thing back, right? And then divide by the standard deviation of those residuals. So I've created this um, object standardized residuals. And then I decided to plot them. This is my... Um, so I'm using the QQ plot function here, the QQ plot, and so it only needs the x, one value, to, uh, to plot because it's going to plot them against um, the, standard, the standard normal um, z values that associate with this, okay, the CDF, if you will. And so what I've done is I've set the y limit, which is the only one I can control here it will not let me change the x values. So I need to make the y values match up to the x values to get a better picture. And so that's what I've done. And then I've given it a name and, um, and plotted this. And so, and then the important part of this is that we have those 95% confidence bands, which are the dotted lines here on each side. And so now we see that none of the points fall out of that. Even this one and this one, they are within the 95% uh, confidence interval um, for that, uh, that value. So we don't have any departures from normality, although these two are of a little bit of concern uh, when it comes to uh, does this make an effect on our quality of variance test. It, it should not because it's not outside those uh, limits and it's not even really that close to those limits. Okay. So um, I put this code in there so that you can uh, use this if you need to. If it's not obvious or if you have a question, run this code as well. And then instead of reporting um, this chart, report this chart. Okay. All right. Now, so now I'm, I'm taking a look at these QQ plots, and I want to say this is the default for our method. And so take a look at it, and then look at the one that I created here. So uh, when we look at these, to me, it seems like in the first uh, graph that these points are much further, if I don't look at the confidence limits, if I just look at them, these points seem much further away from the line in this graph than they do from this graph. They seem much closer to the line. And now, one of the things you need to note is that we measure the vertical distance. Okay, So we're looking at the vertical distance here, away from this line, not the distance in this direction. Okay, so we measure these by their um, vertical difference or distance away from the line. And so when you look at that, they don't look as far away um, as they do if you're thinking about it horizontally. Okay, but this makes it look like, um, this line's going to be a straight line. This makes it look like it, it's a long way away. Far away, okay. So um, just changing the scale changes our perception. These points here appear much closer to the line to us than they do here and here. Okay, So that scale is important. So it's always better to control the range of the, your um, standardized residuals uh, to make this um, more consistent and so that it's easier for us to interpret the results. Okay, so that's it for this video. Um, if you have questions, come to Virtual Office Hours. If you need help before virtual office hours, by all means, email me, and I will get back to you as soon as it's practically possible, okay? Please take care of yourself. Stay safe, because we hope to see you next time.